Okay, this is Physics 1C for November 5th. Here's a list of topics we're discussing tonight. There's a lot of really interesting things here. We're going to be talking about induced electric fields and then something called displacement current. That's, allow, that's going to allow us to actually write down all four of Maxwell's equations and kind of look at the symmetry that exists between the electric and magnetic fields that show up there uh, and get kind of a hint at what will be coming later with those. Uh, we're going to talk about superconductors and watch some cool videos about levitation with superconductors. Uh, and then we're going to move into the next chapter, which is these topics here, and discuss uh, something that's really kind of tricky, which is inductance, and try to help you guys understand what inductance is. I have a video for that one, too. Uh, and then we'll kind of finish up what we can in the remaining time. All right, so let's get started. The first thing we want to talk about are induced electric fields. Okay, so what does induced mean? So to take us back, what we've learned in the uh, last chapter, chapter 29 in your textbook, uh, is something called Faraday's Law. It's, it's Faraday's law of induction. So anytime you see the word induced in physics, you're, you're almost always talking about Faraday's law of induction. And the in, idea that we got for that was that the EMF that's induced in a coil uh, ends up being equal to the negative of the number of turns that's in the coil multiplied by the, the rate of change of the flux, basically. Uh, and that's the magnetic flux. Okay, And it allows us to explain how generators work and to show how a moving magnet near a coil uh, will cause a change in flux that will then induce an EMF, which basically produces a current inside of that coil. Okay, so motion of the magnets near coils produces current. And we had already known before this that electric current produces magnetic fields. So um, induced electric fields are the idea that uh, if you can produce current in a wire due to the motion of uh, a magnet or something like this, then within that wire itself, if there's electric current, there's there's probably also some kind of an electric field that exists inside the wire. And that electric field could be described as existing uh, outside of the wire as well, even if there wasn't a wire there. So that's what we want to talk about. And mm, I've got a little picture from your book, which uh, I, th I think we just use it, because I, th I think that the the drawing that I would make would be just awful. So we'll use this and I'll take some time to let you look over what's happening here. So here we have, this picture's pretty big. Okay, so here's what we have. Let's just look at the top part of this first. And let's read what it says. It says, so here's our, here's our setup right here. It says the windings of a long solenoid carry a current I that is increasing at a rate of di dt. Okay, so the solenoid, again, is just this, this coil of black wire right here that's been wrapped around the blue tube. And it carries I, current I that flows down this way, which means that it's going to be flowing kind of in this direction along the top of these coils. And if you wrap your fingers in that direction, you can show that the magnetic field that's produced by such a current would point to the right like this. You should be able to convince yourself of that. Basically, just imagine that you're gripping this tube with your right hand and your thumb is going to point in the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, so the magnetic flux in the solenoid is increasing at a rate d phi dt. And that's because the current itself is changing at that rate, di dt. And this changing flux then passes through a wire loop. So we have this golden wire loop right here that has a galvanometer connected to it. A galvanometer, by the way, is just a current meter, in case you don't remember what that is. It's something that measures current in amps. Uh, and there's going to be an induced current through this galvanometer, through this wire right here, due to Faraday's law. And that's not anything new. We, we knew about this from our discussion last week. So you get, an, you get a new current that's called I prime here that's set up uh, in, this, in this outer wire. Okay, does anyone have any questions about that picture? Current flows through a solenoid. The current is changing at some rate. If we say that it's increasing, then it's going to induce a current in the golden wire here that's going to be in the opposite direction because of that negative sign, because of Lenz's law. So now what we'd like to do is to look at this, I believe, from this end right here. Let me look down and see if that's right. I think we're going to look at it. It's a cross-sectional view. Yeah. We're looking at it from this end right here. So from this end, we would see a magnetic field that points away from us, as indicated by these arrows right here. These X's. 
And we would have a current, which isn't shown on here, I prime. We can throw it in there. The current I prime, remember it was going in the opposite direction right here. But the idea is that if there's a current produced inside of this wire, that means that there are little electrons that are being pushed kind of backwards, or you could think of it as positive charges that are flowing in the same direction. And the reason that they're flowing is because there's actually an electric field there. There must be an electric field inside the wire to actually make these, to make these charges flow. And so the question would become, how do we determine the size of this electric field? That's the question that Anna asked from the problem from your guys' homework. So, so how, how can we find the size of this electric field? So what we can do, does anyone have questions about the picture? Okay. So what we can do is we can say, we have this one equation that says that uh, the EMF that's induced into this wire right here, there's gonna be an EMF, an EMF induced into this wire right here, uh, can be written as negative N times D5 V D T. But one other thing we know is that there's another way to write EMF. So we had this other equation, and at the time we used voltage. And we said the potential difference between two points in a circuit could be related to a line integral of uh, E dot DL. All right. Um, and I think there's a negative sign in this equation as well. With the idea that uh, if you're moving in the same direction as the current, or in that case, in the same direction as the electric field, then your potential is gonna be dropping, right? When you go in the same direction as field lines, you're moving from a high potential to low potential, so that's why that negative sign shows up there. So in a picture like this right here, what we could do is we could imagine that we could perform this operation of doing this line integral right here. The line, oop, there's a vector symbol in that too. Uh, by going around this loop and breaking it up into tiny little pieces uh, that we call DL, little line segments, and basically go around this loop right here um, in the same direction. And we would say that the EMF, so this is called the potential difference, but we can also refer to this as being an EMF as well. And by doing so, we can, we can basically put these two equations together here. So the equations when put together would look like this. You'd have uh, negative N uh, D5 B D T would then be equal to this integral right here. Except now for the loop that we're gonna look at here, it's a closed loop, right? So what we'll do now is we'll actually just put a little circle on there, which indicates that we're gonna perform the integral over a closed loop, the line integral over a closed loop. What happens with the negative signs? I don't remember. I can't remember if the negative sign disappears or not. I don't think there's a negative sign. Sorry, I need to kind of look at the book now because I just don't remember and I didn't write it down. I don't have my notes with me. What are we doing? Induced electric fields. I think the negative sign has to stay there. So I know that this is written correctly here. I don't immediately know why, but we're going to get rid of the negative sign. I think I think I could explain why. Um, so the the rate at which the flux is changing here is such that the flux is increasing, right? But the direction of the current is opposite. So even though the flux is increasing, right, this piece right here, this piece is increasing, um, the direction of the electric field is opposite to the direction of the increase in flux. And so as a result, we have to get rid of this negative sign. You have to have the negative sign on, on only one side, basically. So this is, this is the right way to write this. It's because when the flux increases, the current's going to flow one way. But when the flux decreases, it's going to flow the other way. And yeah, that's kind of the reason for that. So we can actually go through and then we can, we can even solve for what the electric field's going to be now. Because... If we make the assumption that the electric field is constant throughout this region right here, and let's see, how far do we want to go with this? We could even say something about the magnetic field here in DIDT if we want to as well. But first of all, let's just say on the right-hand side right here, 
we could write it like this. We can pull the electric field out. We can say that the dot product between the path that we're taking and E uh, is going to be zero, is going to give us a cosine of zero, I should say. So this is just going to become uh, EDL. And the radius of the path that we'd be going around in here would be R. So when we perform this operation of integrating over our closed path, then we would get just E times uh, the path length. And in this case, the path length would be 2 pi R. And then the left-hand side would still be negative n d phi dt. And then we could say that our electric field now would be equal to uh, 1 over 2 pi r. And really, this would just describe our magnitude of our electric field now, because it's going in a circle. So it doesn't have like a specific direction at any, you know, I can't just label it as a vector. Uh, it's just the magnitude, and it became that here. So we'll drop the negative sign and just say that the magnitude of the electric field now is going to be the number of turns in this coil. This this would be the number of turns in this coil here. It might be one or whatever, uh, multiplied by the time rate of change of flux. And this is what we would call an induced electric field. An induced electric field. In that loop. We could go a little farther as well, but I'll stop for a second and ask, do you have any questions? So what this basically tells us is that a change in magnetic flux is going to produce an electric field. It's not just that a change in flux produces an EMF, it also produces an electric field. This electric field is going to get weaker as 1 over R right here. I want to say something else here, which is to say that we know something about the flux in this case. The magnetic flux in this case would be equal to um, the size of the magnetic field B that was produced uh, multiplied by the area, and in this case the area would be the area of this inner ring right here, and then multiplied by a cosine. It's actually just going to be B times A. Um, and then we could say that um, the magnetic field in this case, it's a solenoid, right? So the magnetic field would be equal to mu naught times uh, the number of turns per unit length of the solenoid multiplied by the current that's flowing in the solenoid and then multiplied by area A. And then we can plug all of this into our flux equation. So we'd have n over 2 pi r, and then we'd have ddt of this. Again, mu naught times n times i is the magnetic field of the solenoid. And then you multiply by the area and we would say that would be equal to the electric field. And then we would be able to say, well, in this problem, mu naught was, is not changing. N is the number of turns per unit length in the black little coils of the solenoid here. And area is the area of the N cap right here. So we can pull all those terms out. They're all constants. So we'd have N times mu naught times A, then divided by 2 pi R. And what's left? Just di dt. So what's left is basically just the rate at which the current is changing. And that would give us the value of the electric field then. Just the rate at which the current is changing here is going to produce this electric field outside. That electric field is going to vary as 1 over R, which means that the electric field out here would be smaller. If you go a little bit farther out, the electric field would be smaller. But nonetheless, you'd produce this kind of circular electric field lines. Circular electric field lines all around this, uh, this solenoid right here. OK. Anyone have any questions? We'll do some problems with this, too, to kind of solidify the idea. Whoops, did I leave out one of the ends? Nope, thank you so much. I was actually afraid of doing that, too. There is still an N right there, and it should show up there. That's right, there. we don't combine. Sorry for... Any other questions? Okay, so a couple things to say about this. Um, this electric field is what's re referred to as a non-electrostatic field. 
So what does that mean? It's a big word. It's, it's something that could not be produced by a static arrangement of electric charges. So it's, it's a type of, it, not only is it not electrostatic, but I believe we could also say that it's not conservative as well. It's, a not, it's not a conservative field anymore, so why do I say that? Let me give you an example or two. So if I, if, I take a, if I take a positive charge, this takes us back to like the very first chapter. If I have a positive charge Q, and I tell you that, that charge Q produces electric field lines that look kind of like this. This is what we would call, and this would, would be an electrostatic field that we could label as E. And then I ask the question, what do you get when you do this? What do you get when you do this? So, so that is to say, suppose that I come to some point right here and I wanna travel in a path around my electric field and I wanna do so, so this is gonna be my path for this path integral here. I want to do so in such a way that I maintain a constant radius r as I go around here. What are you going to get for the value of this right here when you do the calculation? You get zero. And how did you know that so quickly, Ty, without having to really think about it? <sighs> Cosine 90. That's exactly right. So at all points along this path, um, the direction of the path, like here, is at a right angle to the electric field, okay? So in that case, it's really simple to see why this is true, right? So what's, what's another example of one that we could do that wouldn't be so obvious? So let's take, let's take capacitor plates. So let's say I've got two capacitor plates, one with positive charge on top up here, and then one down here with negative charges. These produce nice, really simple electric field lines, right? The electric field lines here would go like this. And so now we suppose we do the exact same thing again. I pick some point like right here, and I decide to go in a circular path. It doesn't have to be circular actually in this case. It could really be any type of a closed path. We'll just choose a circle because that's easy. And I, I go in this direction for my path. The black lines in this case represent the electric field. What am I gonna get for this one? when I do this calculation of e.dl. It's not as easy, but maybe some of you can figure it out. And I want to emphasize too that one of our really early equations was that when we, when we integrate e.dl, uh, it's equal to this quantity here. The path is horizontal. You mean like it stays in the plane of the page? Yeah. But it wouldn't matter. The point here being that we start at one point and we come back around to the same point again. What would you get if you if you took the value of e.dl here? Another thing I can maybe help to say this is that when we write delta v right here, we mean vb minus va, where b and a are the starting points and the ending points. There's no potential difference. That's exactly right, Ash. So we don't really even really need to calculate this because you start at some point A and you return to some point B. So you go all the way back around. You're in the exact same point again. A and B are the same. And any point in space is gonna have a fixed value. So we'd be doing something like VA minus VA, which would be zero, right? That would be zero. So this tells us something in general. The electric field that's produced by static charges, such as on a capacitor plate or just physical charges like that, these are what we call just normal electrostatic fields. And these fields are conservative. And what a conservative field is, is one in which when you do the path integral, right, 
the path you take does not matter, right? The fact that it's conservative here means that this integral of e dot dl is path independent. And it will always be equal to uh, whatever the, the final potential is minus the initial potential. It doesn't matter how you do it. So that means that if I was to choose a path where I went from point A here to another point over here that we call B, and I, and I go along a path and I travel like this or something like that, the answer that I get for e dot dl is going to be vb minus va. And this could be 100 or something, and this could be 90 or something like that. Maybe you get 10 volts when you do that. And that would be true even if I chose a different path where maybe I go off this way, and then I come this way, and then I go this way, and then I come back to here. Even if I go to a region that's outside of the field, it won't matter. You're still going to get the same answer. Either path that you choose, you get the same answer, right? And that's because it's a conservative field. That's the definition of what a conservative field is in mathematics, that when you do an, a line in a row, that uh, you get this. And it's also the case that if it's a conservative field, that if you do the integral of e dot dl over a closed path, such as this green path right here, you're guaranteed to get zero, okay? So now let's go back to the electric field that was produced here, okay? This electric field is very different because now it's telling us that, um, that when I go around a closed path, so if I start here and I go all the way around a closed path, we saw that it wasn't equal to zero. I'll go all the way back up here. This is what you get now. When you evaluate the closed line integral of e dot dl, you no longer get zero. You get this. You get a fixed. You get a fixed value. So can you see the difference? With electrostatic fields, you always get zero when I do a closed line integral. In this case, you don't get zero. So that's why we call it a non-electrostatic field. It's not conservative, and it could not. There's no way you could produce such an electric field as this simply by using charges. You cannot use electric charges to produce a circular electric field like this. It's not possible. You can think about it if you want to. You can try to produce a field, that, this perfect circular field like this, but it's not possible. It has to be produced by magnetic flux changes, basically. Those magnetic flux changes produce a very unique type of electric field that we call a non-electrostatic field. So you said, is this why you can't make an electromagnetic wave without an accelerating charge? Maybe. So let's just kind of hold that question until a little bit later in the class, because as soon as we write down all four of Maxwell's equations, I think I can answer that question more, more completely for you. What I would say is that you probably could still make an electromagnetic wave. I can put it, I can put it, I guess, in a simple way. This equation tells us that a change in magnetic flux is going to produce an electric field. And what we'll prove here in a little bit is that a change in magnetic flux is going to produce a magnetic field. So the reason why you need something that accelerates is because, and I could put this in a really simple way, suppose that I have a magnetic field and it's equal to something like k times t squared or something like that. And if I take the derivative of this, you know, I'll get 2 times k times t. And then if I take the derivative of that again, I'll just get, what, 2k? And if I keep taking derivatives here, I'm eventually going to get 0, right? So that's part of the answer to your question, Ash, is this equation tells us that a changing magnetic field, flux, but field also, is going to produce an electric field. We'll prove in a second that that changing electric field can then produce a new magnetic field. And if that magnetic field is also changing in time, then we can repeat the process back over again, where you go from B to E to B and then back to E again, right? Um, so like if this term here is proportional to electric fields, 
and this term here ends up being proportional to magnetic fields, then if eventually one of these drops to zero, right? Like if this is t squared, and then this is t to the first power, and then this is t to the zero power, and this is just zero. That's basically the answer to your question, Ash. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, we'll see that directly when we, when we write down all Maxwell's equations, why this would be true. All right, so non-electrostatic fields, it's not a conservative field, unlike static electric fields, which are conservative fields. All right. So we want to use some problems to kind of uh, learn what's going on here. Now, I pulled a problem from a different book because I felt like we could do this one because it's easy, and then we'll do the other one because it's a little trickier. So we, I think you always learn a little bit more from the ones that are a little more challenging, as long as they're not too challenging because then you haven't had enough time to sit and think about this stuff on your own. Uh, okay, so we're going to use the same problem here, and that means we're, I think we're going to be able to basically just use this equation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plot that out right now. So suppose the long solenoid in the figure above has 500 turns per meter and a cross-sectional area of 4 centimeters squared. The current in the windings is increasing at a, it feels like a lot, 100 amps per second. 100 amps is just a lot of current, so to increase that rate is pretty insane. But this is for a physics problem, not about like an engineering kind of design thing. First, we want to find the magnetic field that's induced in the, find the magnitude excuse me, of the induced EMF in the wire loop outside the solenoid, and then find the magnitude of the induced electric fields within the loop if its radius is two centimeters. Okay, so we, we need more than just this, but we can just, we can rewrite the equations. All right, so same picture as before. What we know have now is that the number of turns per meter in the, the solenoid is 500 turns per meter. I'll try 500 meter inverse. It has a cross-sectional area of four centimeters squared. And they tell us that the rate of change of the current, the current is increasing at a rate of 100 amps per second. The first thing we want to do is to find the magnitude of the induced EMF in the wire loop outside the solenoid. For that, we can use Faraday's law. where the magnetic flux is going to be equal to the magnetic field times the area. And as I said a moment ago, the magnetic field in a solenoid is given by this equation. Putting all that together, we get EMF. The outer ring only has one loop, so this N is going to be one. So we're going to get negative d phi dt, which is going to be d dt of b times a, where b is equal to this. And then also times a, and we need to take the derivative of all that stuff, but only one of these things is changing, which is the current. So we end up getting, and let's just do the, the magnitude. We end up getting mu naught times the number of turns per unit length multiplied by the area, and then multiplied by the rate at which the current is increasing. That's gonna be the EMF in the ring. You know, maybe it'd be helpful to have this picture over here. Let's just copy this over here and make it a lot smaller. Then we can at least point to it. All right, so that would be the EMF that's induced in this ring right here. And if we knew the resistance, we could use it to find uh, what the actual current is. All right, so what is that going to be equal to? Me? So mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meter per amp. We multiply that times number of turns per unit length, which is 500. turns per meter, and then times area, which is 4 centimeters squared. Uh, and we'll just convert that, I guess. So 4 centimeters squared, which we can multiply by 1 meter over 100 centimeters. And then we can just square that. And that should give us the induced EMF in our ring, the golden ring right here. Whatever that gives us. Let's calculate that. You guys can calculate it too, just to kind of verify I get it right. All 
I got something like 2.5 times 10 to the negative 7. Do you all agree? And we get the same thing. Okay. So about 2.5 times 10 to the negative 7. Now, so the big N, uh, you should keep asking those questions. That's good, because I know how confusing this can be. This big N right here represents the number of turns in the outer coil, the coil that has the EMF induced in it. Up, oh, I didn't put the 100 amps per second in there. That's right, you're right. So this is actually going to be increased by, OK, so let's fix this. This is going to end up being 10 to the negative 5. And DIDT should have been right here at the end. I got confused, or I got distracted by doing the conversion. Thank you for noticing that. So there we go. That's going to be the EMF there. I hope I didn't mess that up. Why do I have to check this each week? I used to have this one memorized really well. I feel like the meter's in the bottom, just looking at the way that this works out here. Pretty easy to figure out. Let's see. So it should have units of Tesla meters squared divided by seconds. So the amps cancel. Oh, it, it is. Okay. So this is correct. This is correct. Okay. So then part B wants us to figure out the magnitude of the induced electric fields if the radius is two centimeters. So one thing I can say, there's our equation right there that we're going to be using basically. But if you look at this equation right here, basically we've already calculated mu naught a times n times di dt. So you can actually write this in another way, and it's often written like this in textbooks. The EMF that's induced, if it's a circular loop, is basically just going to be, sorry, the electric field is going to be the EMF divided by 2 pi r. It's basically what that equation up there says. So if we use the answer we got here, 2.5 times 10 to the negative 5 volts, and we divide by 2 pi times the radius that they gave us of 2 centimeters, so times 0 0.02. Then that will give us, yeah, the, the n, big N is 1 in this case. So that's going to give us 2.5 times 10 to the negative 5. Here, let's just actually use the number I got last time. No, we don't have to do that. Divide 2, divide pi, and then divide by 0.02. Okay, so I got about 1.9. Here, let me see what I get if I actually just use the number that we got before. Because there was a pi in there, which is going to cancel out. So we do that and divide by. Yeah, so you get exactly 2 times 10 to the negative 6 then. That's if you use more digits here. I actually use something like 2.51. So you're going to give it 2 times 10 to the negative 6, and the unit for this is going to be like volts per meter or newtons per coulomb, whatever you want to use. This is volts and this is meters, so that's the easiest thing to write there. So that would be the size of the electric field in the wire there. Anyone have any questions? Wait, you didn't get negative six? Oh, you know why? Because I didn't, I know. It should be uh, negative four, right? Is that what you got? Negative four? Yep, yeah, that's right. That's right. The number in the calculator slot is seven there because I left that off there. Okay, that's a pretty easy problem. Um, maybe a little too easy. I know that there's a homework problem you guys have on your lab manual where you have to go a little bit higher level of difficulty. So I grabbed another problem, not from your book, but it's still a good problem. So here it is. Make it big enough that we can see it. All right. You have a question, Mr. Miars? The problem? Sure. You have a hard time reading it on there, probably. OK, 
Okay, so it says, uh, should I make it bigger so it's easier to read? It's only so much bigger I can make it. Size is okay. All right. Okay, so it says, uh, within the green dash circle shown in that figure there, the magnetic field is changing with time according to the expression B equal to 2t cubed minus 4t squared plus 0.8. There's no units there, but the magnetic field is going to be given in Teslas and t in seconds. The larger r right here, big R, is equal to 2.5 centimeters. And we're supposed to figure out when the time is equal to 2 seconds... We want to calculate the magnitude and the direction of the force exerted on an electron located at point P1 right here. So we're going to imagine that there's an electron right here, and it's going to feel a force. And we want to learn, or we want to understand, what direction and what size of force is this electron going to feel. So first thing we'll do is just find the magnitude. All right, so let's write down what the equation for the magnetic field is. So that's our magnetic field as a function of time. Let's write a few other things down here. Big R is equal to 2.5 centimeters. And we have to figure out at T equal to two seconds. We need to figure out what the force on the electron is. And to do that, it's really gonna be, the force is gonna be equal to the charge on the electron, which is negative E, multiplied by the electric field. So this is the thing we're gonna wanna find is what's the size and direction of the electric field push, uh, created at this point right here. All right, so it's, the, the electric field in this case is going to be circular in nature. And we could, I guess I could just draw a circle with the shapes. So the electric field at this location, that's big enough. That looks kind of okay. It's not exactly perfectly centered, but if we were to draw a circle like this, then the electric field along this uh, path is either going to point this way or it's going to point the other way. And we could figure out for ourselves what direction it's going to point. But let's let's fig we'll figure out what the direction is in a second. And we kind of need to think about what the direction is going to be. There's a lot that goes into that. In the previous problem, we knew that the magnetic flux was increasing, right? What do we know now? Is the magnetic flux going to be increasing or decreasing? What do I need to do to figure that out? It depends on the time, right? Yeah. It depends on the time here. It's okay, we can take the derivative. Yeah, exactly. Let's do that real quick. So let's take the derivative. That's certainly going to be useful anyway, because it's part of our flux equation. So we take the derivative, we'll get 6t squared minus 3 times 2 is 6, right? Okay, 2 times 4 is 8. That's t to the first power. And then this term, there's, there's nothing left there, right? Now, if I want to know if it's increasing or decreasing, we need to plug in t equal to 2 seconds, right? So if we plug in uh, the derivative at 2 seconds, we'll get... So we do dv dt at two seconds. That feels like a really weird way to write that, but without calling it a different function, I don't know what else to do. So it would be six times uh, two squared minus eight times two. So tw six times four, 24 minus 16. Eight or something like that. The, the key thing here is it's positive, right? If it's positive, that means that if the slope is positive, then B is increasing at that time, right? So we know at, did I say that pro properly? Does that sound right to y'all?
Yes, no, what do you think? Is that right? Magnetic field is increasing. Pretty sure that's right, right? Yeah, okay. All right, so magnetic field's increasing. So can anyone tell me then, what's the direction of the electric field then? Now Faraday's law, we can use to figure this out basically, because Faraday's law says, or Lenz's law, that if the magnetic flux through a loop is increasing, then the direction of the induced current is opposite to the uh, change in flux, right? So if the magnetic field is increasing, that means the magnetic flux is increasing. And if you point your thumb in the direction of the magnetic field that points into the page, your fingers of your right hand would sweep around in a clockwise direction. But because it's increasing, you need to flip it so that I believe the electric field needs to point exactly the direction that I picked here, which that was completely random. I just chose one of the two. I wasn't sure immediately. So Lenz's law tells us the electric field at the point where the electron is here basically has to be pointing in that direction. Did everybody follow that? Do you want me to go through that again? Yeah. The reason why you do the opposite is because it's increasing, Ash. That's what the negative sign means in Faraday's law of induction. When the when the rate of change of flux, oops, when the rate of change of flux is positive, the EMF is in the opposite direction. So what you do here is you say, okay, what I always do is this. I point my thumb in the direction of the magnetic field, right? In this case, so that's what you want to do first, is point your thumb in the direction of the magnetic field. And then you say, all right, is the magnetic flux increasing? In this case, it is. So you flip your thumb around so it's pointing out of the board. That's what the negative sign tells you to do, flip your thumb around. And then the direction that your fingers curl is going to be the direction of the current, as you said, Anna. But in this case, there is nothing there to have current in it. Would you agree? There's no, I just drew a ring on here, right? That ring is an imaginary path in space. And if there was a coil there, if there was a, if there was a loop of wire here, then there would be a current. But because there's no loop of wire, there is no current. But that doesn't mean that there isn't an EMF and therefore an electric field. You can still have an electric field produced here in empty space around a changing magnetic field. Yeah. Okay, did that make more sense, Ash, when I said that? I'll repeat it again. You start off by pointing your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. You say, is it increasing? If it is, you flip your thumb around, and then your fingers are going to curl in the direction of the electric field. If it was decreasing, you would just leave your fingers in the same direction, and then you would just kind of, yeah. Okay, uh, you said, I knew the flux was increasing because of the time, right? So had we chosen a different time here, probably a time between zero and one seconds, I would guess. Although I'm not sure. Yeah, certainly. If T was one second, actually, the electric field would point in the opposite direction. You can see that here, because if you plug T equal to one second into the time derivative of the magnetic field, the rate of change of the magnetic field. If I put T equal to one second here, I would get negative two that would mean that at one second, the magnetic flux is decreasing. And if the flux is decreasing, then the direction of the induced EMF would be in the same direction. So that at t equal to one second, the current would be this way, and the other second would be that way. And, okay, Ty's disagreeing with me. Oh, wait a second. Maybe I said something wrong. Oh, okay, so, okay, t equal to 1, you're saying that, let's see, t equal to 1, see, 2 minus 4, yeah, you're right. 
So then actually that would change it too, yeah. It's interesting because yeah, this so this this picture here where the flux is into the page, is that even accurate? If we put two seconds in, we get two cubed is eight times two is twenty-four minus yeah, you're fine. That's fine. <laughs> okay, so at t equal to one second, actually, yeah, you're right, Ty. It turns out the electric field will be in the same direction, but that would be because the field itself would actually be pointing out of the page at that point. That's interesting. I'm glad you caught that. Okay, so we still haven't solved for anything yet. All we figured out is the direction. So we, we technically solved B, right? So we know that the direction of the electric field at this point, at point P1, at time t equal to two seconds, is pointing that way. And that means the force on the electron is going to be the opposite direction. So the force is going to be this way. And that's because it's a negative charge, right? All right. So let's put everything together here. So if we want to find the magnitude of the force, we need to find the electric field. So that's what we're going to do now, is we're going to find what the electric field is. So what is the size of the electric field? So our equation from above basically said the following. If I do integral of e dot dl along a closed path, that this is equal to negative number of turns times d phi dt However, in our case, uh, there's no turns in the wire, so little big N is going to be equal to 1. And we're going to get, on the left-hand side, it's again going to be E times 2 pi R. I suppose I should be more clear about what we're doing here. So if this is our, if this is our path that we're taking, then our DLs on our path are going to be pointing like this. Pointing at every point in time in the same direction as our electric field. So the electric field points in the same direction which means that the dot product between the two of them is just EDL, and then you pull the E out, and you make the comment that E is going to be constant all along the path that we've chosen because it's a circular path with a constant radius that's R1. So I left one thing out here, actually. That would be 2 pi times R1 because it's the radius of this path right here, which is indicated as R1 right there. Okay. All right. So... That's the left-hand side. The right-hand side is going to end up being negative d d t of the flux. The flux in this case is just going to be b times the area over which the magnetic field exists, which is just pi r squared. And then what we have is basically pi times big R squared times d d d t. And I believe from here we can solve. Let's go ahead and divide the 2 pi r1 over to this side. And we just get that electric field is equal to that. And I believe we can just plug everything in. So we end up getting the electric field is going to be equal to pi times big R squared, which was 2.5 centimeters. dbdt, at, we've actually already calculated this, didn't we? We found what dbdt was at two seconds. So I'm just going to go ahead and put in here eight. And the unit on this should have been teslas per seconds. Because b is in teslas, and you take the time derivative. So you're going to get... Yeah. Uh, so eight teslas per second. That's dbdt. Looks like I dropped the negative sign here, so I'm just gonna we're just gonna say this is the magnitude. Uh D B D T is eight, and then we do one divided by two pi, and then R1 is five centimeters. So we do zero point zero five meters. And that should give us the value of the electric field. The unit should work out. We can check. The end if we want to. Hey, there's a pi that should have gone away, right? Oh, they're still there. Okay, We're, they're, they'll just cancel out. So, R squared. Yep, the R squared disappeared. I'm doing really bad at like at missing these things tonight for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, so big R squared. We could just throw it in there. That's fine, right? Let's just check. So it's pi. Nope, it's already there, right? I don't need to do that. All right, so let's do this. Let's erase this. Erase this. Okay. So pi. And it's 0.025 squared, that's R squared, 
dBdt is 8 teslas per second, and then 1 over 2 pi times 0.05, and then the pi's will cancel. Thanks for catching that. Okay. Point zero one five nine is what I get. This is going to be in volts per meter. Tesla meters squared per second divided by meters. So one thing I'll tell you is like just from Faraday's law, Tesla meters squared per second is equal to a volt. Uh, it's pretty easy to see if you just look at Faraday's law that, because Faraday's law says that's the time rate of change of flux that's equal to voltage, right? So if you do T times meter squared, that's flux, right? Divide by seconds, you get volt. And then there's another meter hanging out down here. So all of that gives you voltage and then you divide by meters to get volts per meter. You can get the answer? Okay, let me, let me try it again. I probably threw an extra pi in there or something. I sure did. So you had to multiply by pi. Being silly. Did you get 0.05? Did you get 0.05? Okay. Good, good, good. There we go. That sounds like the right answer. It's probably been a year or so since I've done this problem, but that sounds like the right answer anyway. There we go. We already figured the direction out for part B, so that's the answer to part A and B. Part C says, does, I'll just stop for a second. Anyone have any questions or did everybody follow all that? Yeah, so I know for a fact you have a problem on your lab manual homework that is extremely similar to this. And I think that, I think there's one that's very, very similar to this one. And then there's one where the only difference is that the magnetic field itself is like at an angle. So you introduce an angle, but that angle is just going to show up inside your flux equation here tricky stuff but I, I think that mathematically it's it's reasonably simple to do and yeah the, the reason why the electric field so the electric field points this way the force has to be the opposite direction because it's an electron in fact we actually didn't completely solve it because if you read the problem carefully what it says calculate the force so technically what we would need to do is we'd have to say that the force would be equal to the electric um, charge times the electric field. So this would be 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 times the uh, coulombs multiplied by 0.05. Did I answer your question, though, Astral Lover? It's basically just because it's a negative charge, and negative charges have a force that's opposite the direction of the electric field. Okay. Uh, whatever this would be, so you're basically doing this times a half, so it's going to end up being like 0.8, and then you got to move the decimal place one to the right. I think this is going to be like 8 times 10 to the negative 17 or something. I don't know, let me see. Other way, 8 times 10 to the negative 21. And that would be in newtons. Because volts per meter can also be written as newtons per coulomb. Okay, very small force for a really small particle. So it would actually have a massive acceleration. You know, something to think about here is this problem is very, let's say, mathematical and unrealistic. I mean, how do you. How do we go about producing a magnetic field that varies in time like this? And get kind of creative and probably figure out how to do it. But um, the biggest thing I, to take away from this is that just the fact that you have this magnetic flux that's changing here, it produces forces on electrically charged particles. It's kind of surprising, I think. Just the act of a changing magnetic flux here produces these forces on these electrically charged particles. And it's all because of Faraday's law. So, it's 7 o'clock. 
it's a good time to take a break, right? We got through number one. Maybe we can get through a couple more of these before the end of the night. It's a hard topic, though. And I know, I know that this is... What we did here is useful to you for one of the homework problems you have on the lab manual, so... Any questions before we take a break? I'm glad you find it interesting. I do, too. And it will get more interesting after we do displacement current, because then we can write down Maxwell's equations and look at how it all fits together. I'm going to wait until Mr. Meowers finishes typing, but I think I'll just go ahead and stop recording.